And now for today's program, which is part of the Wide River Project, an initiative that takes a deep dive and fresh look into the art history and issues that both unite and divide the Black and Jewish communities. It is my pleasure to welcome today's guest. Jacob Kornbluth is an Emmy award-winning filmmaker who has directed five feature films and over 200 shorts. He was awarded a special jury prize for excellence in filmmaking from the Sundance Film Festival for his feature documentary, Inequality for All. Jacob founded Inequality Media with Robert Reich, which has been a lighthouse brand for economic storytelling and played a crucial role in framing an economic case for policies in ways everyone can understand. Jacob is the director and producer of the new documentary, We've Been Here Before, which explores the role of the punk subculture in fighting back against white nationalists and neo-Nazis. Pan Nesbitt, born and raised in Portland, Oregon, joined the skinhead subculture in his late teens and emerged as a community leader in the wake of the murder of Mulu Geta Sarah in 1988 by racist skinheads. He works tirelessly to advance racial justice and create spaces where people from all backgrounds come together and enjoy the universal language of music. He is an artist, musician, and co-founder of a DJ collective who believe that being anti-racist is being human. Eric K. Ward is a nationally recognized expert on the relationship between authoritarian movements, hate violence, and preserving inclusive democracy. He is the recipient of the 2021 Civil Courage Prize, the first American in the award's 21-year history. Throughout his career, Eric has worked with community groups, government and business leaders, human rights advocates, and philanthropy. He currently serves as Executive Vice President of Race Forward. Nadine Epstein is an award-winning journalist and author. She has been the editor-in-chief and CEO of Moment Magazine since 2004, and is the founding and executive director of the Center for Creative Change. Nadine's most recent book is RBG's Brave and Brilliant Women, 33 Jewish Women to Inspire Everyone, which she wrote in collaboration with the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Please welcome Jacob Kornbluth, Pam Nesbitt, Eric K. Ward, and Nadine Epstein. Suzanne, thank you so much. It's great to see you. Nadine, Welcome. We're on opposite coast this time for this Wide River Project episode, aren't we? We've switched. Usually I'm on east, you're on west. This time I'm west, you're east. And I'm east. And um, you got a chance to meet my father. Folks folks don't know my father will be 99 in uh, uh, October. And you got a chance to hang out. I saw some photos. They were uh, amazing. He had a great time. He was amazing. And today, by the way, my would have been my dad's 103rd birthday. 103rd. Wow. Happy. Well, he may his happy. memory be a blessing. Wow. Yeah. I'll honor that. Well, it's great to be here. I'm very excited. You know, back in um, 2017, I released an, an essay um, that some folks listening and watching today may know called Skin in the Game how uh, anti-Semitism animates white nationalism. And it was a thesis about the uh, growth of the white nationalist movement. And at the time, a controversial statement that anti-Semitism would once again mainstream itself in America. And I talked a little bit about why that would happen in that very long essay that some people fell asleep, I imagine, before they got into the first third. Um, but somewhere buried in that essay was also um, some narrative about my life and um, how I came to, to understand uh, uh, anti-Semitism. I talked a little bit about growing up in Los Angeles, uh, working poor and black and the midst of school desegregation and kind of this punk music scene, right? I always like to throw out this thing that I think surprises people, right? I was in this band, I was the lead singer, it went on to become sublime, blah, 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 right? And uh, I grew up in this kind of volatile but beautiful uh, community that was the only kind of multiracial uh, uh, community. And so I'm excited today because we're going to bring both of those stories together. And for those who are kind of listening today, we're going to ask you to bear with us. The title of today's episode is called It's Not a Conspiracy, the Jewish and Black Origins to the Skinhead Movement. Now, most of us, and I'm going to stop right there because folks are probably like, what? I was telling folks today up on Capitol Hill about this and 
It was literally stunning people. And so let's stop, take a breath. We are gonna unpack that, folks. You're sitting there wondering right now, what does that all mean? We promise we're gonna get there. And we're gonna tie that conversation not only into the origins of the skinhead uh, uh, movement, uh, but also what it means, another look at black and Jewish relationships, which we tend to only talk about through political lens, right? This is a, a, a cultural look at black Jewish relationships, both in the skinhead movement, right? And amongst those of us who have come together to, to tell this story. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, anti-Semitism as well. And um, I promise before we end this conversation, all of this will make sense. It will be exciting. And at a moment where things feel very hard, we hope that it opens up some space in this moment for hope and new directions and new relationships. Does that sound good, Nadine? Did I leave anything out in the opening here? Usually I let you do this because you are succinct and on target. Well, I, I just wanna say how much I love this project and how important it is at this time to be exploring the currents and this wide river of relationships between Blacks and Jews. And also it's really, this is truly a, a really juicy, complex cultural knot that we're about to dis entangle, detangle today. We are gonna detangle it. And we promise um, uh, if you are a person who actually has hair, you may lose it through the course of this conversation. I so. Let's let's get going. I want to start first by taking folks back uh, to this article, Skin in the Game, in 2017. What I lay out is that uh, uh, anti-Semitism wasn't just a form of religious bigotry, that it also was a racialized form mm -hmm. of bigotry, that anti-Semitism, as it plays out in the modern era, predominantly is within a frame of race, meaning it frames Jews not as a religious or ethnic other, but as a racialized other. This was largely propagated uh, first by a book called The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, a fake conspiracy narrative, right, that places Jews at the center of a global conspiracy. We saw today, uh, uh, then it was called the International Jewish Conspiracy. Today, we call it the Great Replacement Theory. I see Elon Musk has put out a video today on, on Twitter propagating the great replacement theory. It is that anti-Semitic narrative that has fueled violence uh, against the Jewish community, but also against minority communities by individuals who believe that people of color are the puppet or the puppets, right, of their Jewish puppet masters. So I outlined this in the uh, uh, essay Skin in the Game. Some folks have read it. Uh, folks have argued about it, uh, but we still talk about it. About a year ago, I don't know, I feel like it was about a year ago, uh, a filmmaker who is with us today, uh, Jacob Kornbluth. Jacob, welcome. Uh, glad to see you today. I promise we're going to get to actual conversations with you both today, but I want to set a little bit of context. Jacob reached out to me just about a year ago, and he said, you know, I saw this testimony you gave uh, in front of a Senate subcommittee on anti-Semitism, and I want to do an interview with you, a short video, and talk about this theory you have around anti-Semitism. But he did something that most folks never ask me. He asked me the question, how did you develop this theory? right? Usually folks just want to argue with me about it, or they want to focus on a specific piece they like, or they want to reshape what I think. But Jacob actually asked me, where did this come from? And so I told Jacob, you know, I actually learned it in my uh, music subculture. As I said, I came up in a very uh, uh, interesting time in the U.S., it was a moment of desegregation. We were being bused to different schools, right? I was in school with folks across lines of race. And I can tell you, it wasn't gonna be crossing lines of race that were gonna bond us. Luckily for us, we had a new vehicle of identity and it was punk and hip hop. 
And many of us forge new relationships across uh, uh, that piece. But I did something brave uh, uh, with Jake. I said, if you really want to understand how I came to, to learn about anti-Semitism, you should come up and spend time with my community in Portland. I have an amazing set of friends uh, that I've been friends with for decades in Portland, Oregon, who are also part of my community scene. And Jacob, being kind of a pioneer filmmaker, accepted the challenge, brought up a film crew. Jacob, it's good to see you. Let's talk a little bit about the film and about you coming up to Portland and what you learned and um, what you decided to do with it. Yeah, well, so so great to be here, and what a what a cool uh, uh, intro into being able to talk about uh, this short film. So, um, it was it was a film originally that a Jewish group had come to me and asked me to look into with a very simple related question, which is, we need some new ways, some film to storytelling that opens up some new ways to talk about anti-Semitism, and. Um, how, can you look into that just with that sort of open-ended question? So that's when I came across Skin in the Game. That's when I came across your testimony. And I thought, uh, I got to talk to this guy. Like he's he's got some things to say and I can't wait to hear him. So you and I spoke a little bit, but the other the thing that really got me personally into it was um, I had a family member in my extended family with my wife who is deeply conservative and I think sort of veers towards the QAnon conspiracy theorist level of conservative. And they had said something interesting to my wife or partner when I wasn't around. They had said, your, um, your husband is a propagandist who will do anything for money. And I remember thinking to myself, um, that's surprising because that doesn't match up with any of the things that match me as a person, but they do match up with what I understood stereotypes of Jews to be. And I didn't know how else to think about it. So I needed some way to understand if something was moving, a kind of hate was growing that I wasn't aware of at the time. And I wanted to figure out some folks who had some new ways to think about it. So this sent me on the journey and then we spoke. And I have to say, when you invited me up to Portland and when I met Pan, when I met, um, uh, Mike and Aaron and some of the other folks who you knew from this punk subculture and the, and the Portland scene. I felt just such compassion and 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 love for this group. I mean, it was such an amazing group because people might uh, who aren't in the punk scene might think of it as a forbidding group to enter. And everybody was authentic and real and just like genuine people in a way that like opened me up and made me feel happy to just be around these folks. And while I wasn't in the punk, uh, in the, you know, skinhead scene in, in Portland or in LA, I was, came up also sort of in the punk scene myself and had this sense of like, there was an idealized version of uh, not having cliques or groups as a teenager that the punk scene seemed to sort of attract the particular type of misfit that was looking for that for, for some other group to kind of put us in. And I felt like I saw something of myself in all of that crew. And I, you know, I remember when you introduced me to Pan, what an amazing uh, experience it was, because here's this guy, I mean, we've never met before in our lives. And um, when I heard him start to tell a story, I start to feel like, you know, as different as we are, I can see a lot of things that I can relate to in your story. So, um, I just felt like really lucky to be a part of it. I remember feeling like jazzed in the way that like you feel lucky when you're a documentarian because you get to enter other people's worlds all the time and it's a real joy to do that. But when you really connect with the people, there's something special that happens there. And I felt like that happened on my trip up to Portland. So um, that's where it started anyway. I don't know how deep to get into the story just yet, but that's yeah. that's my intro. We're, we're gonna we're gonna let me ask you a question so then follow up. We're we're gonna go we're gonna go in and then we're gonna introduce Pan as well. But I I wanna um, you know, folks are like, what is this? What is this documentary? What is this film? You all keep talking about. I get like emails and texts all the time from folks saying, where can I see this thing? You know, some folks got a chance to see it at the Los Angeles Holocaust Museum uh, a few months ago, sold out crowd. 
The Los Angeles Holocaust Museum says it was the by far the best event that they have ever hosted uh, there at that site. They had to turn people away. Um, uh, uh, my phone has been ringing off the hook ever since. How can we get our hands on this film? We're going to tell folks, get to L.A. on uh, April 8th or get to San Francisco on March 28th. Um, you might be able to, to, to do it. But for the people who are here right now today, we're going to show you a little clip in uh, um, uh, a little bit. But of course, I got to talk a little bit more. <laughs> so from this experience, you make this doc called We've Been Here Before. What the punk scene can teach us uh, about white supremacy. And uh, in it, we talk a little bit about me growing up in LA, uh, growing up in this music scene. And we almost have to stop in the same way. When I talk about skin in the game and I talk about it 2017, does not in 2024 sound like a big deal. We were talking about anti Semitism in 2017. We've already forgot anti Semitism is so normalized that we have forgotten that most of us didn't even think anti-Semitism was a big deal in 2017 in the United States, right? In the same way, some of us may not understand just how segregated, right? If America is still segregated today, we forget how segregated it still was in the late 70s and in the early 80s, right? It was a very segregated place. There weren't uh, very many places where people hung out together across lines of race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, willingly, right? Uh, maybe you did it because you were in the army. Maybe you did it because you're on a sports team. Maybe you did it, but not because you willingly like leaned out. And for many of us, it was both scary, but it was scary being around folks who didn't think or look like you. And it was also kind of exciting. And that was kind of the the punk scene. Um, it was, yeah, yeah. Can you, can you explain like how the punk scene and the skinhead movement are connected? I yeah, think it's we're we're gonna come to it because the interesting thing, Nadine, is the skinhead movement actually predates the punk movement, right? And then finds its revival when the punk movement comes back, uh, uh, when the punk movement comes into its own in 76 and 77, right? And um, that's the way it makes itself uh, to the US. But I, before we get there, I wanna bring in Pan, Pan Nesbitt, longtime friend, Pan, it's good to see you. DJ, lead singer of Weekend Kids, welcome. And let's turn to Pan right now, Pan, Many of us find this subculture within the punk rock scene called skinheads. And for many of us, that scene was not driven by neo-Nazis as the media imagery was. It was a bunch of kids who were Asian, black, white. Help us understand the discrepancy of how we understand, most of us understand the skinhead movement Talk to us about the origins and talk to us about how it fuses into punk rock. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, it's a real pleasure. Um, and hello to everybody out there. Before I really say anything, this is really um, my story that I'm speaking from. Uh, my experiences, uh, my education, traveling the world, books, um, experiences, meeting people. This is a lifetime's worth of knowledge that I'm presenting to you at the age of 52. Um, I actually got in the skinhead scene when I was in my mid to early teens. Um, but in order to understand skinheads, you got to understand sort of humanity and that we're tribal just at, at like base and think about high school. And I think you got touched on earlier, like, you know, you have your your, your B-boys, your skateboarders, your nerds, your jocks, all the different groups, your punks, your, uh, you know. The whole, the, all, all those different groups. Well, that's, you know, that, that goes back in time. And the origins of Skinhead, which Eric's asking me about, um, root directly in England and, uh, and their colonies. So the West Indies were a colony of, of England. And uh, 
World War II was a major factor in uh, the Russo Inez. Um, a lot of damage was done to London and, and the surrounding areas from the bombings that Hitler did. And a lot of immigrants came running to England to help rebuild London and the surrounding areas, just England in like a general. And part of that was the Windrush, which was the West Indians. And they brought with them their uh, music, their, their, their uh, clothing styles, dress, um, kind of sus, uh, as well as some of you know their 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 own gang behaviors and you know the rude boys and you can do your own research on that. Um, but a lot of their roots came from America too. So from from uh, radio waves, they would hear R and B from the South, or they would travel up you know to a, to America to work during the summer times on the plantations and fields down in the South or Southeast, and uh, would buy records and bring them back. And there was a whole. Sort of that's an introduction of Western music. I mean, I guess that's sort of a racist thing to say. Um, industrialized music, uh, American music into these islands, and which would then sort of uh, gyrate and ferment in with the uh, with with the root music that they brought with them from Africa and the local music, um, and that created a whole bunch of music: calypso, ska, um, ska being the important one here. Uh, and uh, with an infusion of soul music also as that progressed. Um, and so when they came to England, they brought that style and that music and sort of some of their like gang, uh, their gang culture, um, some of them not being a gang culture. I mean, that's everything's a generalization, understand. Um, and a lot of them ended up in the East End and the East End were Docklands, working class, poor white British kids who took some of the biggest brunt of Hitler's bombs and some of the biggest damage was done out there. Um, and they intermixed. And they went to the same schools. And they built and worked on the same projects. And kids became friends. And styles kind of merged. And music kind of merged. Mod was really big. Uh, mod's a style subculture. That's another thing. Like, skin is not really a, a movement. I think movements are political. Uh, skin is a, a subculture and a style. It's a way of life. It's... Um, it's um, as much as being a skateboarder is, or being a b-boy, or uh, being a lawyer is, I, I would say. Um, but within that subculture are a bunch of movements and a bunch of pol like 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 politics. So I got a lot of time here because I'm keep going. I got a lot of time. All right, you got time. I, I mean, got time. time here. So, so with this infusion, all this kind of intermingled, and um, skin is a word that was put on us by the press. It wasn't a word that we created. This, and I, and I, I'm, I'm talking like 67, 68, 69, 1967, 68, 69. Uh, we were called peanuts. Uh, there were Marine bases out there in the East End and, and, and the Marines had shaved heads. And so the mods who had sort of like, think of early Beatles hairstyles, um, started cutting their hair shorter and shorter and shorter with this infusion of the Jamaican subculture. Or not subculture, but culture, um, West Indian culture, not just Jamaican. Um, and that just progressed. So they're called peanuts, they're called no hairs, they're called skinheads, you know, there's a whole bunch of words. Not only were the West Indians immigrants, but so were Pakistanians and so were a lot of Jews who were refugees. And the mod culture was based upon style and like dress who, you know, this bunch of poor kids trying to outdress each other. It's like one upping, you know, who, who is the most sus, who has the best dance moves, who has the nicest lambretta, who has the best, you know, the, the coolest shirt or the best tailored suit. And these Jewish kids, some of them had tailoring dads, you know, they had tailor shops and were wearing some of the most sus gear. And of course they were skinheads too, because they lived right there in the East end as well. And, uh, so, you know, they would, there was a gang mentality. It's a lot of it was based on football, Chelsea, Millwall, Arsenal, West Ham. Um, and, you know, within these schools, you know, these little gangs would, would form and they would get the sense of like style and like and like dress. And that progressed probably 70, 71. Then it exploded throughout England. And as it exploded, well, so did I, and I just disappeared. As it exploded throughout England, it would sort of change and think about a wave. So that first sense of style and that first dress progressed throughout England and as it progressed change followed it and so after skinhead came uh, suede head and smoothies and then boot boys and these are all subcultures that are interlinked with skinhead um, and then punk um, boot boys were sort of more into like glam think of like Slade or T-Rex those kind of bands 
where Skinhead was based around more reggae. And so I just kind of skipped that. Mods listened to soul and like ska. Early ska turned into rock steady. Rock steady was kind of like lover's rock for us. Um, slower, a lot of soul covers, a lot of like smooth dance moves. Um, that was Skinhead. Um, that was Skinhead. That football, maybe a row with, with the guys from the other school or from the other like football firm. Um, and then that progressed into reggae. And early reggae was Skinhead reggae, Oregon based. Um, and you can Google that and you can educate yourself on that. Um, and then that spread out and then eventually led to glam and glam led to punk. Um, and a lot of the first, you know, a lot of glam artists and a lot of first uh, punk artists were originally skinheads because everybody in England was a skinhead in 71 and 70. Everybody was. It was in the newspapers. It was a fashion sense. It was a fashion style. Well, the National Front and British movement um, saw this and was interested. Why were they interested? Because when punk came out, reggae then went to Roots. Roots was more black identifiable. And, and it wasn't like they were ostracizing the white kids or the Jewish kids. It was just loving the fact that they were black and finding their roots. And the white kids, some of them identified and continued with that, and some of them didn't. And the ones that didn't went to punk. The BM and National Front saw that and said, what the fuck? And so they swooped in and started to politicize and, and, and to grab their yeah. hook. Can pause I just pause you right in that spot right there. Because here we have this moment where you have this youth subculture that's as popular as hip hop is today among Absolutely. young people. It is made up of Caribbeans, Blacks, and Jews, primarily, <laughs> or sorry, Caribbean, Blacks, Jews, Everybody. Italians. Everyone's coming into this youth subculture. Then a Black consciousness develops and takes the reggae or the early ska into something called roots reggae, which I, ironically is also influenced by Judaism, right? It's it's yeah. based off of Jewish symbols, right? But it opens up the door. There's there's heavy immigration. There is this far right attempt to take over, to co-opt this subculture. Jake and Nadine, I don't want to go ahead. You're on mute. I just want to, I'm a, can you hear me? Um, is that, I just want to point out something that you said that was so interesting that one of the really cohesive things about the movement was fashion, not fascism. And it sounded like, and it's a very important point because these were kids that were into music and fashion. And, and fascism and skinheads in the, in the sense of skinheads that we think of today invaded this movement. And so I just wanted to be really clear that we understand that. So back to, back to this. And so Jake, we're going to come back to Pan to pick up this story of the co-optation. And, but before we do, so Jake, you hear this story, you make a film. Why did you find it important to tell this story? Um, the, the idea that um, the, uh, you know, what, what Pan and you have discussed as a kind of, you know, multicultural, you know, kind of uh, welcoming subculture became what almost everybody today thinks about as they think of the neo-Nazi skinhead idea. How did we get from there to there? What was this idea? And, you know, Erica. one of my favorite things of our conversations, Eric, early on was like trying to trace that and, and seeing that like a lot of your anti-racist um, uh, what you've given your life to, which is, you know, kind of being an anti-racist activist was rooted in this kind of transition and trans and, and followed this transition felt to me so, like such a compelling story um, and so useful to folks thinking, trying to think through um, how to deal with their real fear of what's happening to democracy today. Because you talk about like, you know, the, the, the hate infiltrating the punk scene and having to fight for it, to hold on to it. And I have a sense that people are worried about a lot of things that way. Like when it feels like our kind of public discourse is getting more and more filled with hate and we're more and more scared to kind of uh, speak or to feel 
um, at home in our world, how do we deal with this on a larger scale? So even for folks who aren't just focused on anti-Semitism or aren't just in the punk rock scene or aren't just, you know, thinking about their skinhead, you know, stereotypes or some connections they had to the punk movement early on, there's a story here that feels like it speaks to kind of everyone, but has the story of what happened to these to this one particular group. So I really loved that. I wonder, I think we have a clip from the film I'm wondering if now might be a good time to to share it. This is just a little clip sort of starting with um, some of my conversations with Eric and going to uh, to Pan entering the film. So if we can show that, that'd be great. The difference about the uh, form of anti-racism that I came up in is uh, in my subculture, we wanted to destroy racism, right? Race has a concept, right? We understood that it was a false idea that was preventing our subculture. I'm a Jewish skinhead. I honestly became a skinhead not because I'm Jewish, but because I love the music. Skinhead's not about race, creed, politics. It's about culture. It's about subculture and sharing that subculture and bringing people together that might not otherwise be together. I think it's the mid to late 80s where shit really got political, where, yeah. where they got to be like neo-Nazis. But prior to that, it was a skin that was like anybody. Yeah. That's how I first came across the, what's now known as the white nationalist movement. They were Nazi punks out of the suburbs of Orange County who would come into these shows to be disruptive. It was, if you're a skinhead, you're a Nazi, you're a you know, racist, Confederate flags, neo-Nazi, that's what you are. And that really was bullshit. I'm an anti-racist skinhead. Eric is an anti-racist skinhead. It makes me want to watch it all. And uh, folks are gonna, they're gonna find their way, their way to it. So, we are finding our way together in this moment, Pam, right? It's it's the 80s. Um, uh, folks may not believe this, but, you know, if you don't believe us, check out a new series that just started on BBC by the director and creator of Peaky Blinders uh, called This Town, which is the, the British story of what's happening in this moment uh, in England and in the midst of the two-tone movement, right? Madness, the specials, English beat, right? The, the fusion of reggae and punk into a second wave of ska is occurring at the same time that the British movement, right, is attempting to co-opt the skinhead movement there. But here, Pan, we're coming of age in the 80s. We found our way together through punk and, and reggae, but all of a sudden, we also find ourselves being co-opted, targeted, our friends and others by groups called White Airing Resistance and, and others. And this really plays out. I remember going to shows, punk shows in Portland, Oregon in the, the mid 80s and just watching neo-Nazis physically invade these shows, right? Attack uh, participants, attack minorities on the streets. And soon, folks like you and I found ourselves getting it from both sides. Folks thought we were neo-Nazis and we had neo-Nazis targeting us. Pick, pick up that story because I think there are lessons. What folks don't understand is what is happening in this country now, right? Witnessed by January 6th, the mass shootings, neo-Nazis marching on the streets. We actually face that at a smaller scale within our own subculture in the 80s and 90s. Eric, can we just pause for one second before Pan answers that and give a little background? So Eric grows up in Long Beach, California, and he moves to Portland, and he becomes part of the, the, the movement there, the punk music scene there. And Pan, he's growing up there. And I just was wondering, Pan, why don't you give us just a little taste of how you became like you were, you went to school, you went to high school and how you became, I remember you told us a story about, cause I talked to you early about your dad and how you became a skinhead. Um, and 
because you have a dad, your dad was also a tailor. So tell us just a tiny bit of that before we go to Eric's question to have a little bit of background. There. Well, it's, it's similar, but my dad um, was actually in the theater, but he was a greaser back in the day. And we watched West Side Story one day and um, he showed me a switchblade and told me his like story, which is tribalism. But um, and then he passed away. Um, but I then moved to Portland. I was living out of, out of state at that time and uh, was going to punk shows. You know, as 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 a kid, you're trying to find that niche where, where you fit in. And uh, um, punk was kind of what I liked. And so I was going to punk shows and Eric nailed it. Um, we would walk in and you have 40 guys at Zig Island or they'd send the little guy to start a fight and then they would swoop in and like jump you. And it got real complicated um, as I became a skinhead, which was a couple of years later, as Eric touched on too, because you'd get it from like both sides. You know, I, I grew up in, in, in black neighborhoods. I, I grew up in neighborhoods that were, uh, that were mixed and, and uh, my friends who were black didn't understand at first, you know, and walking to school, kids would roll out balls or their truck toys to try to trip you up and, and snicker. And it was kind of really complicated. And sometimes you'd have to like get in a fight because somebody wouldn't listen to you. Like, no, you're not, not racist. You're not Jewish. No, you don't look Jewish to me. What the hell, blah, blah, you know, and then, then you get in a fight or, it's the other way around where you're always having to look in the mirrors or in the like reflectors of like storefronts, like, like the window glass to see who's behind you because of the Nazis who we call boneheads um, would be out looking for you and would try to jump you. And uh, so, I mean, that's, that's um, touching on both of those as far as how <laughs> that all for me. Yeah, go ahead. Because I, I didn't quite. So yeah, go ahead. Your grandfather was a cantor, by the way. Oh, yeah. So, my uh oh you want to hear that story so my last name's nesbit but uh originally it was nishnevitz or uh, nishnevitz we don't really know um but my grandfather who was a cantor uh and also a uh, handyman for the neighborhood and and for the temple um tried to get a couple loans and every time he'd walk into a bank the uh the banks would refuse his loans. And one day he walked in and on the on the desk of this banker was a newspaper and it said, Dr. Nesbitt finds cure for blah, 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 blah. And my grandfather's like, laser Nesbitt and got the loan. So, which is sort of ironic. You know, you, you think about how early you see Semitism or where you see it, anti-Semitism in, in, in life. Uh, that was a tale that was told to me as a kid. So I heard that. But my first experiences were in elementary school where... I was at that time living with my father. He was uh, teaching theater and theater production at a local university. And I was in school and there was only one other Jewish kid there. There's one black student and two Jewish students. And uh, he was a couple years older, but he got sent to protect me because I was consistently getting picked on or getting into fights. And uh, ironically, the story I told about my dad watching West Side Story, we literally started a little greaser gang the next week called West Side Falcons. I and mean, it was kind of cute and kind of a joke, but, uh, you know, and it was a bunch of the kids that were being picked on to stand up for, 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 for each other. And it was family based, which is ironic because that's sort of been the tale of my life, you know, um, as I, and as I speak to you and to the audience, you know, I really hope that some part of my story or my story can inspire people, um, you know, inspire somebody, maybe you to figure out, what you can do and how you can do that thing that can make you feel more secure or maybe help fight the anti-Semitism that you see and, or to feel more secure to help your neighbor. I mean, for me, it was about eventually having that kind of family esque gang kind of group of group of people that I surrounded myself with and protecting one another and protecting those around us. And, uh, and Eric come together in the punk rock scene in Portland and then you guys work together with others to protect that scene. And that's what's so amazing. That's yeah. really, I'd, I'd really love to hear. Yeah, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, I mean, something of significance happens in Portland in the fall of 1988. So someone asked, asked a question earlier. So I wrote an answer, but they asked the question, they saw the poster do the Nazi stomp? And they asked, "What what does that mean?" And basically, that that was a slogan, a a, a mantra. And in fact, um, 
are have been lyrics in songs, in reggae songs and in punk, punk songs that really designated that there was a point where many folks in the punk scene and within the skinhead scene really drew a zero tolerance to, to neo-Nazis. That wasn't the case in the beginning, right? The first, we tried to like negotiate it. It was just folks who had a different perspective, but they kept bringing violence. Uh, folks, you know, uh, it's hard to describe the level of violence that they would bring into these shows, um, the harm that they would cause. And remember, most of our parents weren't paying attention, right? This wasn't the helicopter parent era. This was the latchkey parent era, right? Our parents weren't really paying attention. They didn't really, you know, care what we were up to, didn't want to know, right? Law enforcement, we forget. But law enforcement in that period considered punk rockers to be a gang, right? Uh, uh, some punk rockers were institutionalized, right, by their parents because they wanted to. They wanted to listen to punk rock. So we forget that punk rock was seen as very rebellious and and subversive. The music industry, the club owners, didn't care, right? The bouncers didn't care as long as they were getting ticket money. And so we as young kids, we were young, 16, 17, 18 years old, right? We're being preyed on by organized white nationalists who were being supported by adults who ran organizations like the Aryan Nations, White Aryan Resistance. And the physical violence was horrifying. There came a point where we didn't know what else to do, but to defend ourselves. As Jake and I talked about in the film, we came to a choice point. Did we leave this one community that gave us meaning, where our friends existed, right? Where we didn't feel alienated. We didn't feel like the nerds, right? Did we just leave it because of the violence or did we try to stand for it? And so many of us chose to stand for it. And that meant physical confrontation because that's what this neo-Nazi movement brought. That's what began to happen inside of these shows. I'll let Pan pick up because there is something that happens in Portland in 1988, which is the murder of an Ethiopian immigrant by the name of Mulligata Sarah, who was beaten to death by a group of neo-Nazis. And for many of us, it became the last straw. Yeah, absolutely. When Mulligata Straw got killed, it was just, it was done. It was over. I think um, people at that point, you know, were just fed up. I mean, we weren't not still scared or there wasn't still some terror. I mean, a lot of us were, were, were kids. Um, I was really young. And, uh, but we started to organize and, uh, there were groups going around the country at that time that were organizing also um, out of Minneapolis. There was ARA and the Baldies and out of New York came Sharp, which was Skinheads Against Racial Prejudice. Prior to that, in Portland was a small group called SCAR, which were Skinheads Committed Against Racism. And you don't really know their roots um, as far as where they came from outside of Portland. But Sharp worked its way across to Portland, as did ARA. and. Uh, the punks mitigated or kind of migrated, excuse me, to uh, ARA along with uh, just, you know, some activists, normal activists would sort of organize with with ARA and the skinheads um, along with some punks gravitated towards Sharp. Uh, you know, we started holding our own events. Um, uh, we, we started to uh, like musical events. Uh, we started to protest, um, help out other organizations that were requiring either security or uh, just assistance with a, uh, with, with a protest, maybe in a March, or maybe we found out where somebody was working and we would protest a neo-Nazi working at, you know, a McDonald's or we would, or we would put a spotlight on where they lived so that people in the neighborhood knew who was in the neighborhood um, but inevitably for Sharp and for my group of friends, um, it was, there was a lot of street violence. Uh, there was home invasions, uh, 50 neo-Nazi skinheads, boneheads came up from California and attacked an apartment that we used to organize in. 
Um, and that went back and forth and it got really kind of crazy. I mean, and got really violent. Um, and then that led to a point in which some of the, the more political uh, participants didn't really want to um, allow us free reign and try to control us. And some of that mainly sharp, um, but some of the hotter elements in ARA as well, too, for sure. Um, and while that was kind of happening, the Baldies came out and visited, um, or prior to that, the Baldies came out to uh, visit, and they kind of helped along that that path of organization for us. And uh, that was a really great experience. But um, it got a little, it, it got to the point where we were feeling really constrained, and, we're, and the guys that I ran with, Sharp, um, and felt like we were a nonprofit, and we were being pushed into being a gang, and we just sort of grabbed the gang the gang label and ran with it. The cops already treated us like, like, like we were a gang. We were fighting the neo-Nazis like they were the enemy gang. Um, and there was a, and there was a split and sharp, uh, went to the wayside and, uh, Portland United boot boys, Portland United Baldies uh, kind of evolved from that. And, uh, in that process in 1993, uh, there was an altercation between us and, uh, some, some, some Nazis. And, uh, one of those, neo-nazis got killed and got shot in the head with an with an assault rifle in uh, southeast portland and at that point the nazis kind of didn't want to have those kind of confrontations anymore um they were more selective about how they would attack and things and people on our side didn't want to have anything to do with that also so there was there was a a, a big cool down and during that period of time i had left and went to la um and I came back a couple of years later and uh, things had picked back up again. And, uh, at the, and at that time, we had um, reorganized as Rose City Bobber Boys. And that was about when I think Eric was in town. And um, well, that's my first memories. I had just gotten back. And though Eric knows me very well, I also spent a lot of time not remembering. But um, And we ran them out. And that was more of Fist of Cuffs. But it was also living by example. And I think, you know, the question I get a lot is how can I be effective? How, what can I do in my life to be anti-Semitic or to be anti or, 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 to, or, to, or to be anti-racist, excuse me, um, anti-anti-Semitic. <laughs> but, and that really is, is to live it. Um, I live by example. And so the people around me then are affected by my example and that sort of ripples out. And that's what we did as, as, as a crew. Um, we created musical events, we help people out, we would protect people, we would do uh, doorstop watches or porch watches, you know, when like somebody's being threatened, we'd send a couple of guys and they sit on the porch or we'd go inside and sit with them. Or, and um, that, we, we, we ran them out. I mean, it, it took a lot and uh, it wasn't not bloody and I can't, you know, I mean, um, but that's not for everybody. And I think that the first step that people need to take is by living anti-racist. Um, but yeah, do you have any more questions? Yeah. I, Jay. So, well, I just wanted to say one of the things I found sort of revelatory about the story and talking to you guys was um, something you said at some point, Eric, you said, you know, Black people for years have known that you don't get to choose what color you are, how people see you. It's <clears throat> like you said, the word power names you like they get to they they put a label on you in some way. And I remember thinking like um, that punk scene in Portland had, you know, this kind of microcosm where these people were being othered by this uh, by these hate groups, by the white nationalists. And it was a diverse group of people. It wasn't just um, Jews. It wasn't just black people. It wasn't just the LGBTQ community. It was, but they were all experiencing violence. And so this crew had to kind of bond together to say like, if they all are coming at us, we gotta you know, bond together so that we can protect ourselves. That seemed to me to be a pretty useful and interesting kind of micro story that sort of expands to the to the wider story today. And, um, you know, Pan, I think you told me something about, you know, doing, uh, you know, the running the door at a drag show in, in Portland. And, you know, this sense that, you know, it wasn't just about 
just this punk scene in this kind of like, you know, silo off to the side. It was like a group that had that felt like they were they needed to kind of have each other's back in a way that I thought was pretty uh, fascinating. And I'm wondering why this happened in Portland, not in other cities. I mean, what was what's unique about Portland in that era? Yeah, that let me brag. Let me brag on Portland, so so Pan doesn't doesn't have to. Um, but I should say it was happening in other cities. Not every city could claim the same outcome, though. As Pan and I know, there were real repercussions, right, to that that victory, right. We now know in uh, uh, between 2017 and uh, 2023, the Trump administration targeted Portland, Oregon as part of its re-election campaign, right, of its kind of perpetual campaigning. And part of that uh, uh, targeting, right, was based off of the results of the political clashes that happened in the subculture in the 80s and 90s, right? It created a culture in the city that saw itself as anti-racist, right, has uh, uh, against uh, a racist right-wing movements. And when those movements began to mobilize in the midst of the Trump administration, right, the alt-right was trained on the streets of Portland for what eventually becomes January 6th, right? So the story is much fluid, but to come back to your story and, and to brag on Portland, we should remember when this is happening in Portland, Oregon, this is also happening in Los Angeles, right? Pan and I have friends in Vegas, uh, folks we know who were part of our scene, right? Who were lured out into the desert and executed by uh, neo-Nazis, right? Uh, lured out of a bar uh, um, and executed, right? We had friends who were uh, targeted. As Pan talks about the the home invasions, the death threats um, were, were very, very real, Nadine. These fights were happening in Boston. They were happening in New York. Pan can, you know, can attest to it in, in Seattle. I think what made Portland different, right, is the skinhead and punk subculture somehow unisolated itself from the rest of the community. It intentionally pan and others sleeping on the floors of black families, of gay and lesbian families who had been targeted or being harassed, right? Folks with disabilities being able to feel safe in our spaces created a, a strong community, right? That as Jake said, put us in alliance with the Jewish community, right? With the Muslim community. It didn't mean we didn't have our own prejudices. Let's, let's don't, you know, I don't want to get it wrong, right? I didn't grow up with a, a strong analysis around challenging homophobia, anti-Semitism, right? Misogyny, right? That has been an unfolding process as part of that need to come together. But there was a real desire at the end of the day, Folks in Portland, right? The reason I spent so much time in Portland, even when I didn't live in Portland, is I wanted to just hang out with my friends who loved my music, right? Who uh, loved the lifestyle that I loved, right? And who were the closest thing I had uh, uh, to family. That's what made Portland so different. There was a real desire to be part of family together around the things we loved. And those things were being challenged. And there were just enough of us who wanted it so bad, right? That we weren't going to allow people to push us out of that space. And we were gonna work with everyone who would help us hold that family together. So how do we build these families that, how do we take this lesson of what happened, of reclaiming the punk scene from hate in Portland? And what do we, what, how do we take it and this in, and use it in other ways? Well, I think personally, um, personally, we can't be scared to talk and we can't be scared to listen and we can't be scared to help. I think a lot of times um, 
silence is obedience. Silence is acceptance. Um, and it's not, it doesn't have to be violent, but just saying, no, that's not okay. Is, 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 is a step. And I think reaching out and, um, and offering assistance, whether that be financial, if, 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 if you can't do anything, but you can donate money to an organization, do it. Or if you want to do like stamps, like stamping, so you stamp envelopes, or if you want to go on a neighborhood patrol, do that. Or if you want to write, maybe you're articulate and creative and you have something important you want to say, write it, send it out. I think that the first step for all of us is ourselves and our own fears. That was for me, you know, and realizing that our enemy is human, our enemy is vulnerable, our enemy is based upon fear. Not, you know, that's that's the basis of hate is fear. Um, people are in intent are not intentionally, but people are when you boil them down, selfish because of need. Um, food and shelter and anything that might threaten that creates a fear. And that is something that's over thousands of years has been inbred into us uh, for survival. And I think the first step is to break that and to give. Um, I think to be aware of what's around you um, and to not judge, uh, to open yourself up, to put yourself in vulnerable situations. Um, You know, like, and 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 to assist those that might not be like you. I mean, you know, for me, skinhead is the most multicultural subculture that there ever was. And so, to me, this reflects my life. This reflects growing up in my dad's car, listening to like reggae music. This grows up, or this reflects growing up in a neighborhood that's not all white. You know, this reflects my youth. And so, for me, you know, the first thing I did was find people of like mind and then make a stand. And my and our stand initially was finding each other and then that led to violence and that led to education and then that led to protecting others and then that led to really at the core of it really living what i want to be living who i am living a jew living a skinhead you know being me and um and being anti-racist and living that you know like and you know like i, I could have sent my kid to like a private school but i sent him to the neighborhood <laughs> private school was all white and the neighborhood school was mixed you know what i mean like stupid things like that better educations um but that's that's my take on it what's yours eric yeah i mean my lesson from this moment uh, uh jake and, and nadine is that you have to come out of your silos in this moment right the uh, uh we could have all retreated back right oh. in, into our silos and we would have uh, lost our city. We would have lost the thing we loved. And one of the things we loved was being outside of our silos. I often talk about this. You've heard me talk about this. The body and the brain doesn't know the difference between anxiety, right? Nervousness and excitement. It's our bodies respond exactly the same, right? To, to, to both impulses. And often we think of differences right? As something causing anxiety or, or nervousness. But there's some of us where like being curious, right? And uh, uh, um, uh, breed some kind of excitement, right? I, I often say like, it's like, is someone really going to catch me when I stage dive off a, a, of a stage? Like, is that audience going to catch me or not? You don't know. You are nervous and, and you're excited. And it's finding that piece, right? At the end of the day, the lesson I learned is the white nationalist movement wants to isolate us. And that is ultimately how it wins, right? That's how authoritarians win. That's how factionalists win. We have to be brave enough, right? Uh, even if we're not brave enough to stand up against them, right? We have to be brave enough to kind of lean into one another. And uh, look, uh, uh, there are now generations, right, of, of skinheads, uh, uh, in in this country. And uh, no matter where I go around the country, right, I have almost immediate family or immediate curiosity, right, about what's my history, what's my story. And we just have to be more curious. And we have to, we have to stand up for the spaces that allow us to interact with one another. And that's, that's what I learned uh, uh, from Portland, Oregon. I learned how to be brave and courageous about the things I loved. I think mm -hmm. about it too, if I could interject, um, 
I, 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 I think about things and this is some stuff that I thought about back in the day when we were sort of in this, in this position where um, I'd seen this guy get isolated at a show and there was probably 50 people Zig Highland and he got pushed down a flight of stairs, drug out to a curb, his mouth opened on the curb and his teeth kicked out. It's called a Kirby and uh, all because he was, uh, you know, he wasn't a Nazi and, um, that was a point to me where it kind of registered and I thought about it and I was thinking about world war two and I was thinking about if we as Jews only knew now or knew then what we, what we know now, what would we have done? And I would have liked to think that we would have stood up and fought. I would have liked to think that we wouldn't have got on those trains. I would have liked to think that we would have resisted harder. I would like to think that America wouldn't have waited so long and for such an opportunity to get in the war. I, I, I really think that the first thing we need to do is not wait. I think that we need to, you know, and, and life is not life if you're hiding from yourself, you know? Um, so I, for me, I'm a warrior. I would, I, I wish I was born back in the day and I could have fought in World War II. Um, but that's knowing what I know now. Do you know what I mean? And so put that into context and just my little additional two cents. Thank you. Yeah. You all really, really meaningful answers, comments. Thank you so much. I, yeah. I want, want to maybe get to some of the questions. There are some questions I've been trying to answer some. They didn't because I know it's 203 and I know folks were curious. And so, uh, but there are some questions, you know, one question uh, and I'll let you go to the next one. But one question was about violence in the punk and, and skinhead scene. Why did it exist there? And partly uh, it existed there because, uh, um, look, in most working class youth culture, violence is a, is a real phenomenon, right? Uh, uh, if you didn't grow up in working class, working poor neighborhoods, you're a little bit protected um, uh, from that. So it existed because it was actually a reflection of what was happening uh, uh, in society, right? The second, as I said before, is these were subcultures that were isolated, right? Adults ran from it. They weren't curious about it, right? They didn't try to figure out healthy modeling, you know, uh, uh, for us or alternatives, right? So we fell back on the things that we saw in society and society solved its problems uh, uh, through violence. Trust me, the first time uh, a neo-Nazi came up to me, right? I didn't, I mean, he was like three times bigger than me. I didn't try to solve it with violence, right? I tried to like talk. There was, it was pretty apparent, right? After the second time trying that, that there was, there was no space to have that conversation and no one was going to intervene, right? And so that's why there was, there was terrible political violence. And it's why many of us who are in that subculture recognize the dangers of the political violence that is happening today in larger society that we're seeing. Because what we understand is we actually carry the cost of that right, of that violence. It's still very real in our dreams, right, how we walk around in the world, right? Those things still very much affect us. And it's why I tell folks, we cannot abandon these subcultures, right? Whether we're talking about hip hop, mixed martial arts, I don't care if we're talking about quilting, right? Rodeo, uh, uh, country music, right? These subcultures are being preyed on by authoritarians who see, right, still see, these has the places to build their political paramilitary forces uh, uh, for violence and left unchecked, right? We will see what happened to the skinhead culture occur over and over and over again. It may be hard to imagine for most folks that someday the hip hop movement could come to represent right, the face of white nationalism. But I can tell you in 1967, 1968, if you had told skinheads that their social movement would primarily be known as something being neo-Nazi, 
they would have been completely shocked. They could not have imagined. That's how the rest of the world would have seen it. Wow, that brings us full circle to the questions that we were kind of untangling in the beginning. And, and also, I just want, there's some really interesting questions here that I just want to bring out that people are asking. And one is, um, why didn't this happen with the hippie movement or the beatniks? And, and, I, and again, there certainly was violence in the hippie movement and in the beatnik movement as well, but a very different kind of violence. Um, but I'm just curious if Jacob or Pan or Eric have thoughts on this. I was going to let Jake, I've been talking. Yeah. Well, I mean, before I get to that, can I can I go back to the thing about what we what we learned from the the movement? Because one thing that I learned from from the story of uh, of what happened in Portland and listening was to understand the hate was an important piece that they brought to the table. They, Eric and and others, like figured out where they lived. They figured out how the how the white nationalists and the neo Nazis operated. And it was in a way like a thing that as we get more stuck in our silos, we become less aware of humanizing and really understanding what the perspective is of the people who are coming from places that we that are different from where we come from. And I thought that the culture that they, um, what they did, one of the things that was really interesting was bonding together in, in groups that didn't seem so siloed or that would seem unexpected from people from the outside. But the other thing that I thought was really wild was they took time to read the flyers from the white nationalist movements. They took time to figure out where they lived. They took time to figure out where they worked. And they, in a way, got to know these people. Um, you know, it wasn't so much like that they were trying to humanize these people. I'm sure they do. And that's important for all of us to do is just to kind of understand like where all this stuff is coming from. So when you ask like what we can learn from it, I think that's one of the things is like, I don't think, I think there's a sense of kind of like fair, you know, that this is just happening and it's scary with the rise of white, uh, of, of anti-Semitism and white nationalism in America, but it's happening in a way to people who we don't really understand at all. And we don't understand why or how. And understanding this a little bit is um, not too much. I'm not saying like, you know, uh, forgive everybody for, for these, for some of these horrible beliefs, but I think it's good to understand where they're coming from. And I think they struck the right balance there. Really, it's like this is very important because this is happening right now. You never, people never have to live in silos. I spent two hours with Eric's dad a few weeks ago. He is not someone who lived in a silo. Where, whoever you are, wherever you are, you don't have to live in a silo. And now, especially like with social media, people are, oh, so many people retreat into silos. I mean, they just, you could so easy to unfriend people and just, and it's really, it's really destroying our society. And so what we saw in Portland was an example where kids and, and organizers came together and unsiloed themselves. And that's, that's such a great point, Jacob. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, and um, I associated, I mean, when I was a kid, before I got into any scene, punk music was not on the radio. It was not, uh, you know, pop music. It was it. What it was was it was you know in a good way. And I think good music movements have this. It was sort of scary, or it had like an edge to it. You know, that attracted me to it. That attracted. That seemed like oh, that was it. And for me, it's not true of everybody, but it was. Um, militant working class movement. These were kind of misfits and people who didn't feel like they had a home that felt like it came from the working class. And this meant like the sort of latchkey kids, this meant the kids that weren't, you know, in after school, you know, kind of scheduled uh, 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 events. And, and this made it so that this was a volatile group in, in a way. And some of that stuff made it susceptible to some of these things. And I think that's important to say, you know, it's like, I think there's a lot of beautiful things that came out of this. A lot of my friends have sort of their roots in the in the punk uh, movement or in the skinhead movement. But it's also true that there's a lot of volatility from the folks that came out of this. A lot of scars that people had that got them into it and a lot that were capable of being exploited 
by some of these, these, you know, forces along the way. So, um, I don't know if that speaks exactly to why it was different than the beatnik or the, um, or the, the hippie movement, uh, or if they're the same in that way, but I associated it more with, a, you know, a group that I saw that like, I loved that, that they didn't feel like they had a group to go to other than this, or that we didn't feel like we had a group to other than this, but it also made us and some of us sort of vulnerable to, to some of these things going either way. And um, I felt that, and I feel that in a lot of people today, even in a way that's sort of scary in, in a kind of the democracy discussion that, you know, some of the folks that I thought uh, would be guardians in some way of, of a democracy are susceptible to some of these totalitarian, you know, messages because it's, it's touching in something. So I saw that firsthand in the punk movement and I also see it in the, in the larger fight for democracy. Right. I think the point that's been made several times here is that youth subcultures are rebellious subcultures and they're often, they're coming around, they're, they're focusing, they're coming to, around music off it. And, um, and, you know, coming up and there was definitely rebellious and there was definitely violence between greasers and hippies. And there were definitely violence within different parts of the hippie movement. There's, you know, it's, it's very complex, but I don't think there's an, a story to be told in the same way as the Portland story here. And this, and this subculture is so unique and it's one we know so little about. And I, I want to ask one more question that I think is really interesting being the only woman on this, on this panel here. Um, so, and uh, several people have asked me this question, um, and I know there was a woman in your film, Jacob, but, um, were women part of this? Was this, is this mostly a male culture or were women part of this as well? There was a lot of women when I grew up, um, a lot of really strong women. Some of the leaders were women, uh, within the skinhead scene, there's women. Yeah. I mean. Everybody, every teenager in England in the early 70s and late 60s was a skinhead. So that's boys and girls. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of really powerful women. And even in like the two-tone scene, there was Pauline Black. Um, I mean, just to name one off the top of my head, um, who is a singer. But yeah, there's plenty. There's And in Portland, significant amounts. I mean, Portland's kind of on the front edge of, of all that, I think, um, where uh, we really try to... Uh, open doors not close them yeah. but do so much if you do it's so stupid to shut the door on potential help and potential intellect or, or or muscle or whatever i mean you know i was thinking about it too about the, the question before just a quick little note um you know punk was uh was rebellious as was stated subculture but it was also about the like that came from like the the children of the 50s and like 60s and it was they were F everything, you know, they like they believed in anarchy. I mean, this whether it was seriously or like not this put that into context. So it was about doing everything you didn't want them to do. <laughs> and uh, skinheads were just very working class. I mean, and I and I think the, the hippie scene was uh, like more middle class, but I don't I, know. either. That's a perception. Definitely. I think the hippie scene was multi-class. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I imagine there must be some upper class part of the punk scene as well, but yeah. not the main part. I mean, I think there was like the art school, the art school punk scene. For um, sure. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And we yeah. appreciated those folks too. We did. Yeah. That's where you got, you know, anyway, we're not going to go down that, that lane. It's, it's too, but you know, uh, uh, those bands like X, right. And others who, who were right. They were artists. They, they were, um, they had been deeply influenced by the glam scene and uh, experimental, but really the skinhead scene was, uh, uh, and even mod culture, right? Which the skinhead scene came out of was uh, uh, another form of rebellion, right? So if hippies rebelled against their parents by dressing completely differently, right? Mm. The mods and skinheads rebelled by saying, we're gonna actually outdo you. Right yeah. in, in your dress, then we're gonna we're gonna make it so traditional, right? Uh, uh, that you will notice us because we are uh, uh, an even better, harder image of uh, of what you claim. But the other is is that you have to remember these were Caribbean Jewish kids, Italian kids 
right? They weren't working in the business offices. They were working off the docks, right? They were working in the tailor, in the small tailor shops, right, that existed. And uh, uh, a lot of the dress, right, the, the boots, right, came from, uh, right, Folks who worked on the docks, still toed boots, right? So that your feet didn't get crushed. Shaved head or which, you know, now I'm old, so it looks really shaved, right? But short hair, so it didn't get caught up in the machinery. There was actually reasons behind much of, much of the kind of dress in fashion that these groups of kids uh, uh, adopted. And yes, I, I, but I do want to say something. Oh, go ahead. Maybe see. Look, we're talking. You go. Oh, it. Had, so you're basically saying that the original skinhead look had nothing to do with Nazis at all. No. Yeah. Oh. Basically, they so would have hated. I, get back to this fashion thing. The fashion is so amazing here. It was fashion. I like it. We're gonna make a postcard off of what you said, right? Fashion, fashion not, fashion. not fascism, right? Yeah. I realize too that these are kids of uh, people that fought in World War II. You know what I mean? I mean, these are children that are, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, Nazi symbolism in the first time around was highly looked down upon. Nobody was supportive of anything like that. Absolutely not. That's that right. <laughs> and for those coming in late, we should tell them there is now a link. Suzanne has put a link uh, into the chat where you have probably walked in and you're like, why are we all talking about skinheads? You can uh, uh, watch the story of skinheads. If you watch closely, somewhere towards the end, you might see someone who looks, you might see a cut, fast, fast cut of a face in an audience um, uh, at the Oppressed. I think it was the Oppressed show in, in uh, Toronto. Good, good weekend. But the piece, Nadine, I want to come back to the gender piece because it's um, it's really important here. The, the the skinhead culture was broad, right? So so of course there is a there were there are skinheads who are in gangs or crews, right? There are independent skinheads, right? There were women who were there were entire women skinhead crews, right? Um, uh, that existed. Of course, we live in a society like the the thing around you subcultures is. They're not completely distinct from the societies they live in. So when you ask, you know, wh what is the role of women? It was largely resembled the role of women in society, right? And so, yes, misogyny existed. But I have to tell you, within the skinhead scene, right, uh, uh, how one is valued often transcends race, gender, right? Religion. Those weren't the primary factors upon what which were judge one. What were the primary factors? What bands, what bands you listen to, a pan would tell you, you know, how you dress or Eric, how you don't dress, right? Would, would define like a, um, a, a, a lot of things, right? How much, how much volunteer time, how many hours do you invest in in your community, do you show up? Right? Do you, it's the same things that one would judge uh, 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 in other kind of of cultural spaces. How much knowledge do you have about like the the history? Right? Uh, uh, there's there's all kinds all kinds of things. You know, at, at points though, it could come. How long have you been around? How long have you been around? Right? How are you? How trustworthy are you? Yeah. How trustworthy are you? Do you, you know? <laughs> Pan, let's talk about. We won't talk about this, but I can tell you. You know, Pan wasn't there, but I can tell you the first time that I showed up, right in at a Portland show, right. <laughs> Folks wanted to know. Uh, uh, okay, you showed up at one show, but will you come back to a second, yeah. right? Right, like, will you show up again? And the 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 reaction to when I showed up the second time was much warmer than the first time, right? I showed up because folks wanted to know, like, will you show up for your community, right? And it's those kinds of things. But look, I can tell you, I have met uh, 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 skinhead crews that are um, made up of gay men, right? Uh, there are crews that are made up of, of folks who identify as trans and non-binary, right? They aren't as big, just like in society, right? They're not as big. 
But those things really, really existed. It was a culture that was politicized by neo-Nazis. And the truth is, right, the answer, my answer to Jake's question to bring us full circle, right, was that I was part of a subculture. I was probably the first grouping of non-Jews to fight anti-Semitism, right? And we didn't even know we were fighting anti-Semitism. We were just fighting to be together. That's wonderful. I have, I have one more question that we've been, because we've been talking, been using the word gangs a lot. Yes. Gangs and gangs, we haven't used the word gangsters, but I feel like, you know, we need to explain that about what are what are gangs? What are crews in the skinhead in the punk movement and in the skinhead movement? So we can clarify that. There's a clear definition difference. I think um, I, th I think if you think about gangs on the house, on the in a different context, you're thinking about money making operations or something that would uh, deal with generations like that, or maybe territorial. Though skinhead crews are territorial, um, they're mostly based around taking care of one another, especially within Portland. You know, it's family. Um, it's making sure that people can pay the rent, making sure that uh, people are OK if they're in the hospital, making sure that they have someone to pick them up or bring them food, making sure that um, people's kids are OK. Um, it's just looking out for one another, making sure your car, your your buddy's car runs or you know, your homeboy's car runs. Um, if you can help out by, by volunteering some time, like I was just uh, – in Europe because uh, of a family tragedy. And when I came home, my fence was rebuilt. Like the guys had rebuilt it for me because we had a problem during the storm. I mean, like doing little things like that, just taking care of one another. Um, a lot of us come from broken families, not all of us. And that's another misnomer. But the thing that is not a misnomer is that we are alone a lot of the times and isolated or misunderstood or kept at arm's distance. And sometimes we like that, but regardless of that, you know, we're left to take care of one another. Um, and especially in the early days of anti-racism, you know, a lot of people didn't even understand what that meant, you know, like being uh, like uh, white pride was different than white power where well, there is no difference. Um, but, you know, like in, with 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 that mindset, um, people were really uh, they really wanted to keep you at arm's distance. They wanted to push you away. They were appalled or not appalled, but maybe scared or maybe like they just didn't understand it. And uh, so we take we took care of each other. I mean, you know, the people that I surround myself with are the people that I love and care about. And that's my hood. That's my crew. That's my neighborhood. Um, yeah, as, well, sure. as well as my blood family. But, you know, I mean, that's but I think that is the main dif the, the main difference is that we are family and family is a very important word to use in that sentence. That's a very important lesson for all of us, too. We're all family. We're all crew. I mean, you all crewed up too. I mean, everybody out there, you, you got a knitting crew, <laughs> you got a swimming crew, you got a tennis crew. You know what I mean? Like, Y'all got your own little your own little neighborhoods in one way or another. Yeah. Jacob, <laughs> what do you think? Tell us what will you do with all of this? Um, are there more films on the way? It sounds like we will have more screenings. Well, first, first, we're going to, as far as the film goes, we're going to have a set of what we think of as conversation starter screenings around the country. So we're going to have one in San Francisco on March 28th, which is what, like in a little over a week. And we're going to have some anti-hate skinheads on the, as part of the discussion. And you'll be there, which I'm sure anybody who's in the Bay Area will love to see. We're going to have a screening um, that's going to be at Manny's, a place in, in the Mission. If anybody's interested, um, we can maybe post a link uh, to the to the screening in our chat somewhere. And then we're going to do another screening uh, April 8th. So a little bit after that in L.A. at um, Creative Artists Agency, a uh, 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 agency in, in L.A. And then, yeah, there's been some I saw there was some comments about bringing it to D.C. And we I would love that. I know, Eric, you would love that, too. I think we all know the roots of the kind of social justice punk movement run deep in in dc and um and we'd love to uh just connect with some of that community and and and, and bring this message um which is about walking the story of a subculture and talking about its implications to 
uh, the threats to democracy today, we'd love to bring that right to the nation's capital if we can. So that's all in the works, we hope. Well, yeah. we Nadine. We and I just wanted to see if, you know, if we should wrap up soon um, before we go back to Suzanne um, and see if there are any last thoughts, if there's something that you just need to say that you haven't, hasn't somehow, we haven't gotten to. Look, I just, before we turn it back, and, and we really do need to turn it back to Suzanne, we have a few minutes left. I want to thank uh, Pan and, and Jacob. Jacob, thank you for 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 telling the story and allowing us to, to tell our stories. Um, what happened in the 80s is often referred to as the invisible war, right? Uh, our community was being preyed on by white nationalists. And uh, no one paid attention and no one cared. And uh, we hope folks listening will draw some strength and, and energy at a time where they feel they're under attack and no one cares. Uh, understand, we know what that feels like. We are empathetic. And the answer is to build community and not just within your silo. You have to take that leap off, off the stage. Pan, always an honor. Thanks, Thank man. you for being part of, uh, uh, of my community and a uh, community that I felt like I could I could stay in. Uh, uh, I know it wasn't easy and I know the costs were high to, to you and many of my friends. Uh, uh, it's an honor. And Nadine, thank you for giving us the space always and to the folks at Moment Magazine for letting you and I explore very complicated uh, nuance issues and and for those who who come and listen to us uh, 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 from time to time to to see what we're talking about it means a lot and with that I'm going to turn it back to the fabulous Suzanne to to tie us off thank you thank you all so much for joining us for that really important interesting conversation again I want to remind everybody the film is We've Been Here Before so if at some point in the future you see that title you'll know that it was from uh, this program today. I also put in the chat, uh, Eric had shared with me when we were preparing for this program, a documentary called The Story of Skinhead by Don Letts. Uh, it's, you can view it on YouTube and it gives kind of the whole history of the skinhead subculture uh, starting back in um, London. And so uh, I really encourage people to watch that. Uh, you can find this program tomorrow on our web website at momentmag.com slash Zoominars. And I wanna thank everybody for joining us uh, who, who watched today's program and we will see everybody next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone.